Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to ENG 503. This is your prose 2 paper. And uh, in this paper, we have been discussing short stories. We started off this module by um, discussing um, Jonathan Swift's travelogue, Gulliver's Travels, in which we um, discussed one voyage of uh, Gulliver, Lemuel Gulliver, um, which was to the land of Lilliput. And after we had done that, uh, we um, discussed the beginning or the origin of the short story. And um, I pointed out that we were going to do a lot of short stories uh, in the rest of the module, as many short stories as possible. And um, all the time, my attempt is to expose you to as many of the great short story writers as possible uh, within the restrictions of uh, time and space. Um, the writer that we are currently discussing is Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, some of you will remember, if not all, that uh, Poe is not an English uh, short story writer as in born in England. He's an American and he's writing in the English language um, and writing rather well. And one of the things that I have um, tried to emphasize throughout these uh, lectures on Poe's sh short story writing um, is the fact that Edgar Allan Poe is one of those writers who um, sort of pack his stories with a lot of action and um, a whole lot of uh, events happening, uh, characters, and with the help of um, his style, he tries to communicate to the reader an experience that uh, captures your attention and that then maintains that attention that is captured. Um, the story that we are currently discussing is uh, titled A Descent into the Maelstrom. And um, this story I divided into two halves because it's a rather long story and it's difficult um, to discuss it in uh, one uh, lecture. And I would not like my students to feel that uh, I am putting a lot of burden on to them. As it is, this is an online program. There's a lot that you people have to do on your own. So uh, let me make it as easy uh, as it is possible for you. And that is one reason why I broke up this story, A Descent into the Maelstrom, um, into two uh, halves. In the first half, uh, we discussed how the narrator and um, his two brothers, one elder, the other younger, um, set out to fish one day. And um, it, it wasn't something that they were doing out of, um, let's say, uh, a desire to fish. It was also a means of earning, a means of their livelihood. Um, now, all those people who lived on, um, on, on the shore um, were, um, were earning their livelihood through fishing. Uh, but one of the points that Poe makes here um, is that while uh, the majority of them were fishing close to shore because that was easy, uh, less time consuming, the narrator and his brothers uh, would go out to fish a little farther off into the sea um, towards the, the place uh, or the island that was known as Moscow. And he says that uh, one reason why they used to go there was that there weren't many people fishing. And so they had the place to themselves. The second was that the, um, the fish was uh, there in plenty. 
um, because it was not the regular fishing uh, grounds or fishing area. Therefore, there was more fish there than could be found close to shore. The third is the quality of the fish. The quality of the fish that the narrator and his brothers um, brought in um, was much finer um, than the fish that was, um, that was caught closer to the shore. Now you have to remember that a place where um, not much fishing is done, obviously the quality of the fish is going to be better. Um, the second is that when there are not many people fishing in that area, the number of the fish is definitely going to be greater. So um, they set out to, uh, to fish one day. They get to the island around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, they time it in such a way that between the island and the mainland, there is um, a section of the ocean uh, where you have um, where you have this huge whirlpool that the narrator and the guide see when they look at it from uh, a very high point. Remember that is how the story started uh, where the narrator is taken by a guide to the top of the mountain and from there um, the, the guide tells the narrator to look down below and see what is happening on the surface of the water and that's where he sees this huge whirlpool that the narrator calls um, the maelstrom and uh, which the guide calls the Moscowstrom because of the island in whose vicinity this whirlpool um, is created. So c to bring you back to uh, where I was, the three brothers reached the island of Moscow at around 2 p.m. and in order to get back home safely, um, they have to make sure that they leave at 7 in the evening. If they delayed from 7 o'clock, that um, small window that they get uh, in crossing over the whirlpool, that is lost and then no human being can um, go from one side of the whirlpool to the other side. So uh, the narrator and his brothers, they set out from the island of Moscow, not realizing uh, that there has been a difference in the pattern. And while they are um, trying to get back to the shore, remember they have this fishing boat that is full of very fine quality uh, fish. So with this fishing boat piled high, um, they make the return journey. And um, soon they realize that um, the weather, um, the environmental conditions are not really in their favor. A storm comes up, um, the narrator's younger brother lashes himself or ties himself to the main mast of the boat um, so that uh, he will be secure. But uh, the main mast is one of the first objects that is broken and um, sort of um, thrown away to the winds. So the narrator loses his younger brother that way and he's afraid that he has lost the elder brother also until the elder brother shouts in his ear and says, I am here. Now, um, when this um, storm overtakes the narrator and um, his brothers, the narrator says that the storm was so fierce that the boat um, rocked, that the boat nearly overturned. Um, and uh, one reason why it did not completely overturn is because um, we were in the boat. 
So, um, the, the part where um, I left you in the last lecture, uh, the two brothers are hanging on for dear life. The elder brother um, has um, ha has the, the the hatch in his hand, and um, he's using that to anchor himself. The, the the narrator finds a ring bolt, and he just holds on to it for dear life, and that is how they go round and round. And the elder brother realizes before the younger brother, before the, the, the narrator, the fact that they are over what they call the Moskostrum. They are already over um, the, this, uh, the, this whirling body of water. And um, there's not much that they can do about it. So that was the point uh, at which we left off. Um, the um, the elder brother whispers just one word to um, the narrator, and that's enough to bring a whole um, sea of ideas uh, to his mind. And um, what um, you uh, what you see here at this point is that the elder brother, because of his greater experience, realizes that they are in the Moscow Strum. So he, so, so he shouts to his brother, and um, his, his brother is surprised. He's shocked, and he says, how can that be? We left the island at 7 o'clock. We have time to make it back to shore. But let's see what has happened in the meanwhile. You perceive that in crossing the Strum Channel, we always went a long way up above the world, even in the calmest weather, and then had to watch, uh, to wait and watch carefully for the slack. But now we were ri driving right upon the pool itself, and in such a hurricane as this. To be sure, we shall just we shall get there just about the slack. There is still little, some little hope in that. So um, the narrator says that we followed the proper procedure, and that was not to come back straight through the um, the slack or through that um, that window that um, that has been um, given to him. Uh, but what he realizes is that uh, the window is not there anymore because it seems like they are driving across the pool. They're not going up above the pool and then sort of double tracking from there. So um, to be sure, I thought we shall get there just about the slack. There is some little hope in that. So the writer says, you know, maybe we'll still get there. But in the next moment, I cursed myself for being so great a fool as to dream of hope at all. I knew very well that we were doomed had we been 20 ti 10 times a 90 gunship. So even if they had been bigger than this fishing boat, even if it had been a huge um, ship, it would still not have been able to uh, battle against... Um, this maelstrom. By this time, the first fury of the tempest had spent itself, or perhaps we did not feel it so much as we scudded before it, but at all events, the seas, which at first had been kept down by the wind and lay um, flat and frothing, now got up into absolute mountains. A singular change, too, had come over the heavens. So um, he says that it's not just the water on the surface of the sea that, um, that, that changes. Above them, in the heavens also, they notice a change. And what is the change? He says, in every direction, it's black as pitch. But right above um, the craft or uh, the smack, the sky seems to open up, and it's a deep, bright blue. And you see the full moon, 
blazing down on um, the narrator. So it's not like it was pitch dark. It was dark. But the strange phenomenon that occurred at this time was that a small patch opened up right above them and from there they could see um, the moon. That, that's to show how, um, how, how clear it was in that small patch. But oh God, what a scene it was to light up. So um, he says that everything became very clear to all of us, uh, but then um, it, was, um, it, it was a scene of destruction. Um, he says, I, made, I now made one or two attempts to speak to my brother, but in some manner which I could not understand, the din had so increased, um, although I screamed at the top of my voice uh, in his ear, he could not hear a single word. Presently he shook his um, uh, presently he shook his head looking as pale as death and held up one of his fingers as if to say listen. So he says that he, he tried to speak to his brother but because the noise had increased so much in spite of the fact that he put his mouth right close to his brother's ear um, he couldn't hear anything that his brother was saying and um, just about that time he raised his uh, finger and sort of motioned to the narrator to listen. At first I could not make out what he meant but soon a hideous thought flashed upon me. So this thought is um, the fact of his watch showing 7 o'clock. But that, he finds out, is not so. It had actually stopped working when, um, when, when it struck 7 o'clock. When it strikes earlier, um, we are told um, what time it is. When it strikes um, the, the, the number 7 or the time of 7 o'clock, the narrator and his brothers know that they have to leave the island and go back home crossing that whirlpool. So um, he says that this thought came to my mind that there's something wrong with the timing. So he dragged his watch out and he saw that it was still showing 7 o'clock. So yes, very easy question to guess. Um, it was way past 7 o'clock and that is why that small window that they had been heading for had been closed. And of course um, with that window closing they are upon the Moskostrom, whatever you call it, Moskostrom or uh, Maelstrom. The effect, the impact is the same. When a boat is well built, properly trimmed and not deep laden, the waves in a strong gale when she is going large seem always to um, slip beneath her and this is what is called riding in sea phrase. So he says that for a boat to be well built and to be well trimmed uh, and not to have a lot of uh, baggage on it, it always seems to slide under the wave. Thus the volume of the, um, the wave keeps on increasing and decreasing because um, water going down to the sea or going down to the ocean is essentially speaking um, a waste. So he says that what, what we were doing was what, it co what is called by um, seamen riding the wave. So the boat um, laden with fish is riding the wave. Well so far we had ridden the swells very cleverly but presently a gigantic sea happened to take us right under the counter and bore 
us with it as it rose up up as if into the sky i would not have believed that any wave could rise so high so so far they have been doing well they're holding on for dear life but they're doing well now you get a wave that takes the boat um so high up that it appears as if it is going up into the heavens and then down we came with a sweep a slide and a plunge um if you have experienced the roller coaster you know what it is like when you go up it gives you a sense of uh, exhilaration it's exciting but what happens when you reach the top you have to come down so when um, the the roller coaster comes down there is a kind of um, a sickening feeling a feeling that um, that that something in your digestive system is giving way that's the kind of um, feeling uh, the narrator experiences when the boat is taken up and then it comes plunging down and when he is at the top of um the 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 wave the crest he takes a look around and he sees what he's going to describe in the next uh, few slides and the same thing you experience when you um, when when you are on a roller coaster the same example that i gave earlier when you're on the roller coaster and you go up you see the entire city from there so in one microsecond you see everything you notice details that you never think you would notice in such a small um period of time so the narrator sees the moscostrom whirlpool he says the moscostrom whirlpool was about a quarter of a mile dead ahead so we were heading directly towards uh, the moscostrom but this is not the moscostrom of every day as it is the moscostrom even when the narrator and the guide look down upon it when everything is calm uh, it is frightening but when the narrator looks at it um, from the top of the wave he says that this was a totally different moscostrom and it was the, the the image was so frightening that he closes his eyes in horror um all and it's almost involuntary um when he closes his eyes because he doesn't want to see how um how, how horrifying it's going to be it could not have been more than 2 minutes afterwards until we suddenly felt the waves subside and were enveloped in foam so one of the great things about the whirlpool is that um in times of storm you don't know how it's going to react you might get waves going very high and then you might uh, not have any wave at all but you just have uh the foam that gathers on top of the wave so he says at the same moment the roaring noise of the water was completely drowned in a kind of shrill shriek and this sound he says you might imagine giving a uh, given out by the waste pipes of many thousand steam vessels so kind of like a whistle uh when they are all letting off their steam together we were now in the belt of surf that always surrounds the world the whirlpool so they're getting closer and closer to the moscostrom and i thought of course that another moment would plunge us into the abyss down which we could only see indistinctly on account of the am amazing velocity with which they were borne along with which we were borne along so when he um hears these uh, shrieks these sort of whistles coming uh, it's like steam engines like a thousand steam engines going off at once and he says i almost didn't have any time to think because of the speed with which we were moving the boat did not seem to sink into the water at all 
but to skim like an air bubble upon the surface of the surge. Her starboard side was next the whirl, and on the larboard rose the wall of ocean we had left. It stood like a huge writhing wall between us and the horizon. Okay, it may, it may appear strange, but now when we were in the very jaws of the gulf, I felt more composed than we were only approaching it. Having made up my mind to hope no more, I got rid of a great deal of that terror which unmanned me at first. I suppose it was despair that strung my nerves. So when he actually gets uh, real close to the Moscow Strom, it's almost as if that panic of nerves leaves him. And he appears to be more calm now because um, anticipation is worse than the thing itself. And that is uh, what uh, Poe's narrator describes here. He says, it may look like boasting, but what I tell you is truth. I began to reflect how magnificent a thing it was to die in such a manner, to die in a whirlpool. And how foolish it was to think, how foolish it was in me to think of so paltry a consideration as my own individual life. Um, we are human beings. We think that uh, not only this world, but the entire universe revolves around us. And yet, when we are close to death, um, we realize that we are really insignificant, that there are things in this universe, in this world, that matter far more than any um, individual human being could do. And, um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Poe's narrator uh, believes here, that he is insignificant, he is unimportant. There are things that are far more important in this world and um, this universe. And with this feeling of sort of despair, he says, I positively felt a wish to explore its depths even at the sacrifice I was going to make. He knew he was going to die. You know, he was totally convinced of that. But in spite of that, he had this desire to explore the depth of um, the maelstrom or the Moscow strom, whatever you call it. And my principal grief was that I should never be able to tell my old companions on shore about the mysteries I should see. So all that he's worried about is, I will never be able to tell anyone what I experienced um, in the Moscow Strum, because I'm going to die uh, before I get to the bottom of uh, the Maelstrom. So uh, another idea that he has is maybe uh, he had become lightheaded, he was becoming faint uh, because uh, of this um, rising up with the wave and then coming down with it. There was another circumstance which tended to restore my self-possession and this was the cessation of the wind. So when the wind drops, he thinks that he's safe now. But um, you and I know that there has to be something else to it. So um, he says that what I now saw was um, that the general bed of the ocean uh, towered above us a high black mountainous ridge. So uh, remember it's dark now and everything um, has a, 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 a totally different um, view. If you have never been at sea in a heavy gale you can form no idea of the confusion of mind occasioned by the wind and spray together. They blind, deafen and strangle you and take away all power of action or reflection. But we were now in great measure rid of these annoyances just as death condemned felons in prison are allowed petty indulgences forbidden them while their doom is yet uncertain. So he starts off this slide by saying that people who have not been uh, on sea in a strong wind cannot imagine what that does to you. It, 
it makes you despair of of everything you lose hope totally because now the narrator feels that he and his brother uh it is only a matter of time before uh they just die and are wiped out uh but he says you know we we were like death condemned felons people on death row uh are allowed certain things which ordinary prisoners are not uh because uh, the prison authorities know that this person um is on the death row is in solitary confinement so they give him uh petty indulgences they give him um small favors because they know he's going to die very soon so it's it's all right if um they give him these things so uh the narrator feels that this is the end there can be nothing more beyond this how often we made the circuit of the belt it is impossible to say so he says i lost track of um how many times we whirled round we careered round and round for perhaps an hour flying rather than um floating and getting gradually more and more into the middle of the surge and then nearer and nearer to its horrible inner edge so they're going round and round but he says i don't know how many times you went round what i did know was that each time we uh, were going round we were going deeper into the funnel so they start at the very top and then they work their way um downwards and he is convinced that when they reach um the um the the pit of the maelstrom they will definitely die all this time i had never let go of the ring bolt remember the narrator is holding on to the ring bolt of the boat my brother was at the stern holding on to a small water empty water cask now what happens at this time is that something goes wrong with his elder brother you know he's uh, been exposed to so much trauma in this short span of time that perhaps um his um, his perhaps his reason gives way perhaps his judgment becomes faulty uh, but what he does is that he lets go of that hatch and um he grabs hold of the same ring bolt that the narrator is holding on to um thinking that um the um the, the the ring bolt that the narrator is holding on to is stronger uh more effective um stronger and uh and and way more effective so uh and that is why he holds on to the ring bolt also so the narrator says that i didn't think it made any difference to me because i was so certain that we were both going to die that um i let go of my hold on the, the on um the the ring bolt and i went a stern to the cask there is that cask or barrel that is um stationed there and he goes and he holds on to that <clears throat> so the meanwhile the boat goes round and round and is also moving all the time uh and the writer says that i had hardly um, secured myself in my new position when we gave a wild lurch to starboard and rushed rushed headlong into the abyss so uh, at first they're going slowly around the whirlpool and then their speed picks up and he says that we go straight into um the abyss thinking that this is the end we should say our prayers commit ourselves to god and jesus christ and that's it so just as he uh mutters a prayer to to god um he feels that they are going down 
his hold upon the cask or the barrel tightens instinctively. You know, it's, it's something that, that doesn't have to do with your mind. Um, these are your reflexes working. Um, you, you feel fear and you grab hold of, of anything. And he closes his eyes because he knows this is the moment I'm going to die. That's it. The end. And then he opens his eyes because he doesn't feel that he has died. He still lives. The sense of falling ceases. So he opens his eyes and he tries to see what is around him. And this is what he sees. The boat appeared to be hanging midway down upon the interior surface of a funnel vast in circumference, prodigious in depth, and whose perfectly smooth sides might have been mistaken for ebony. So it's a black funnel and the boat is hanging halfway down. It's not falling anymore, it's just there. It's held there by the constant motion of um, the water around it. And the walls of the funnel appear to be black as ebony, the, the, the darkest of uh, blacks. Now this confuses him because um, to him it doesn't make any sense that the boat should just be hanging there. Either they should have fallen or they should still be falling. But this phenomenon that he witnesses, it's, um, it's unexplainable and uh, it can't be described how, um, how this happens. And he can see all around, um, there's nothing to hinder his view, um, but he's, he sees that the boat is on an even keel, that is, that um, she's parallel with the water, uh, although she is, um, al although she's, the, the, the water itself is sloping at a 45 degree angle. Uh, but all this is possible because the boat was revolving uh, at such great speed that it could not um, fall down, kind of like what you have in uh, in the death well, you know, um, those those riders on the motorbikes, moth kakuan they call it, um, they ride on it and um, you, you're scared because uh, they're going round and round the well and they come up to grab some money and then they go down when the money falls down they do it in a car, they do it on motorcycles and you are scared because they're taking such a big risk. So that is the kind of uh, experience that the narrator has uh, with, this, uh, with, with this funnel. And he comp the, the interesting thing is that Po here makes this comparison of, um, of the two brothers holding on in that boat to the narrow and tottering bridge which Muslims say is the only pathway between time and eternity. So uh, he's talking about what, what we refer to as the pulsirat, which is supposed to be finer than uh, a hair and uh, very, very strong. And on this bridge it is said that those who are uh, faithful, who um, who uh, are uh, good Muslims, um, they will be able to cross this bridge uh, very easily. And those who do not believe will sort of uh, totter on that bridge. So very interesting comparison um, that he makes. The mist or spray, no doubt, occasioned by the clashing of the great walls of the funnel 
as they all met together at the bottom. But the yell that went up to the heavens from out of that mist, I dare not attempt to describe. So he says that um, there was this uh, foam and this mist and this spray that we experienced. But the, the, the sound and the volume of that sound um, that, that, that rose out of this whirlpool, that, that sound is something that I cannot describe. So round and round they move. Um, but it's not smooth motion. He says we moved in dizzying swings and jerks. Uh, sometimes they traveled only a few hundred yards. Sometimes it was um, with such force that they went almost halfway round um, the world. But the progress downwards they could feel was was slow but it was there looking about me upon the wide waste of liquid ebony on which we were thus born i perceived that our boat was not the only object in the embrace of the world so this is the time um, at which he looks around him and he sees that there are other objects uh, in the whirlpool there are huge pieces of wood that are uh, that have been caught in this whirlpool um, there are pieces of boats and ships and then there is um, there, there are pieces of uh, furniture etc uh, etc et I have already described the unnatural curiosity which had taken the place of my original terrors so that original fright is replaced by a curiosity what are they going to find at the bottom of this abyss will they make it to the bottom or or will they just perish uh, on the way so he says i must have been delirious maybe there was um, there was something wrong with my mind maybe i was going mad because i kept on thinking of these things and i did not feel any fear at all and um, even to the extent of trying to compare the speed with which we were moving and the speed with which other objects um, in the abyss for moving. This fir tree, I found myself at one time saying, will certainly be the next thing that takes the awful plunge and disappears. So he starts looking at other objects and trying to see whether um, these objects are going to uh, fall into this whirlpool or um, keep on going um, round and round. It was not a new terror that thus affected me, but the dawn of a more exciting hope. You know, human beings, as, um, as they go on, um, even when they're having a terrifying experience, um, when the first um, fear has worn off, um, they start getting hope that things um, will, will improve. And he says, I call to mind the great variety of buoyant batter that stood, that strewed the coast of Lofoden, having been absorbed and then thrown forth by the Moskostrum. By far the greater number of the articles were shattered in the most extraordinary way, so chaffed and roughened as to have the appearance of being stuck full of splinters. But then I distinctly recollected that there were some of them which were not disfigured at all. So uh, on the one hand, he thinks of um, the debris that he and others have all uh, have um, seen on uh, the shores of Lofoden, which is the place where the narrator lives. And he says that there are some times when, the, when that debris has that sort of uh, look of having been through a lot and then um, there are pieces of furniture etc that are whole and that don't seem to have been touched and that gives him hope that they will not die their boat will not um, be broken up in the same way that other boats are being broken up now now i could not account for this difference except by supposing that the roughened fragments were the only ones which had been completely absorbed completely absorbed by the funnel and those that stayed on the surface did not get 
um, destroyed. I conceived it possible that they might thus be whirled up again to the level of the ocean without undergoing the fate of those which had been drawn in more early or absorbed more rapidly. So as time goes on, he uh, begins to hope and his hope is that their boat is going to be thrown up rather than down. So, uh, and he starts to think of scientific reasons why um, this can uh, happen and one of the reasons that he thinks of is that two masses of equal size, the one cylindrical and the other of any shape, the cylinder was absorbed the more slowly. Since my escape, I have had several conversations on this subject with an old school master of the district and it was from him that I learned the use of the words cylinder and sphere. So he starts thinking about um, the, the, the shape of the boat, um, the, the shape of um, the, uh, the funnel and he starts to think maybe, you know, we will not sink, maybe we will not uh, drown in this water and be thrown up on the surface of um, the ocean uh, without suffering uh, much damage. So he has, um, he, um, he survives, he doesn't die and uh, he's disgusted with a number of people who give um, different scientific explanations to account for why their boat um, did not uh, sink and reasons why the two brothers uh, survived. So um, one of the things that um, he sort of decides is that he should tie himself to the water cask on which um, with, with which he's uh, holding on because the, the water cask is hollow and he has a greater chance of survival if he leaves the boat and um, he just sort of um, floats onto the water cask. So he does that and um, he tries to make his brother understand also uh, what um, he was trying to do. But um, the brother doesn't like the idea at all, although the narrator tries to explain to him what he is doing and why he is doing it, but because of the position in which he is caught and because of um, the, the lack of communication between them, there's so much noise, um, the, the situation is life-threatening, so his brother doesn't understand what he's trying to do and he refuses to move uh, from uh, his station by the ring bolt as Poe calls it. It was impossible to reach him, the narrator could not get at him physically uh, and so he resigns him to his fate um, and he lashes himself to the cask and once he has tied himself to the cask he throws himself along with the cask into the water and the result is what he had hoped it might be as it is myself who now tell you this tale and as you are already in possession of the mode in which this escape was effected and must therefore anticipate all that I have um, farther to say. So uh, he says that the same cask which is now in your possession was the one on which I tied myself and I threw myself into the water and because of the principles of buoyancy the barrel did not um, sink as he says that uh, the boat did because once he left uh, the boat with the barrel uh, the boat went round two or three times and soon it sank into that abyss, into that whirlpool, uh, taking with it um, his, his beloved elder brother. So um, his, his brother drowns, he survives and he says the barrel to which I was attached uh, sunk very little farther than half the distance between the bottom of the gulf and the spot at which he um, had leaped overboard. So it doesn't travel further 
but what happens is that gradually the gyrations of the whirlpool grow slower and slower and um, with the passage of time the, um, the, the froth and that rainbow effect disappeared and the bottom of the gulf itself seemed to rise up. The sky was clear by that time, the winds had gone down, the, the full moon was setting in the west and he finds himself tied to the cask on the surface of the ocean in full view of the shores of Lofoden and above the spot where the, the pool of the Moskostrum had been. So this was the hour of the slack, this was the time when the whirlpool subsided and that is how um, he, uh, he survives uh, being in the Moskostrum or in the Maelstrom and um, then he's carried to, um, to, towards the shore. A boat picked me up exhausted from fatigue. Obviously he had uh, undergone so much trauma that he was physically and mentally exhausted and he says I was speechless from the memory of its horror. Losing two brothers within a matter of hours would horrify anyone. Those who drew me on board were my old mates and daily companions but they knew me no more. So, so changed was his appearance that the people who picked him up in the boat were his companions. They were people um, he dealt with every day but none of them believed that this was the same person who had gone in the morning um, to get fish uh, close to the island of Moscow. My hair had been raven black the day before. Now it was as white as you see it now. So you remember at the very beginning of the story um, the, the narrator refers to the guide as an old man. Um, they say too that the whole expression of my countenance had changed. So he had lines on his face. Uh, he didn't look the young man um, that he was. And uh, he says from that day onwards my hair has been black. I have the look of an old man. <coughs> So to take you back to um, the beginning of today's lecture, we started from halfway um, of the, the short story A Descent into the Maelstrom by Edgar Allan Poe and in this half uh, Poe has tried to tell us uh, what the guide had experienced. Remember there are two narrators in this story. One is um, the, the narrator who uh, starts off the story in the first person and then um, he switches to the guide uh, who then narrates the story of how uh, it is that he looks very old but is not actually old. So then he tells the story of um, how he and his brothers went fishing and uh, the special place where they fished um, they had chosen because of uh, the number of fish that you could catch in uh, a short time and because of the quality of the fish. Uh, as he says that the fish close to the Moskostrom um, is fine fish. So one evening when they are coming back from there, they get caught in this uh, maelstrom uh, or this storm that, that rises up and um, the, the, the narrator realizes that it is because he has, um, he has missed that window uh, during which the sea was calm. And the reason why that happens is because um, his watch has stopped. And um, that is why they get caught in what, uh, what, what the guide calls Moskostrom, what the narrator, uh, the first narrator calls the maelstrom. And during this, um, the guide says that he loses both his brothers 
Uh, one, because he lashes himself to the mast, and the mast is the first thing that is blown by the storm. Um, the second, because the elder brother, who is also in the same boat, refuses to listen to what um, the narrator is trying to say. He's not convinced. And when the narrator lashes himself to the cask and throws himself um, into the ocean, into that, um, the, that whirling mass of uh, water, his brother refuses to do that. And very soon after that, the narrator says that, I saw my brother uh, going down into the abyss. Uh, and um, he died because uh, there is no coming out of there and because the narrator had uh, launched himself on a cask, on a water barrel, this uh, became the reason why he was saved and very soon after that the bottom of the gulf seemed to rise up, the writer or the narrator rises with it and it seems as if everything is calm. But he has had such a harrowing experience um, during um, those few hours that his hair turns absolutely white and there are furrows and lines and frowns um, on his face uh, which give him a totally different appearance so that the people who actually rescue him in the boat do not recognize him for the same fisherman who had left in the morning from Lofoden to um, catch fish between the islands of Moscow and Varag. So um, the, the narrator or the guide says that since that time, my hair has been white, I look like an old man, I tremble, my nerves are shattered, um, but I managed to survive. I came out with my life, but my mind, my nerves, my body um, were thoroughly weakened by those hours in which my body was thrown about the boat, uh, in which my mind um, went blank and, um, and there was confusion in my mind alternatively because I thought that I was going to die and this would be a very horrible death. So thank you for being very patient. We'll stop here and um, in the next class we'll do another short story and that is going to be another story altogether. Thank you once again and Allah Hafiz.